Hello, everybody. I'm Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach, and I'm the founder of the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program, creator of No Hassle Newsletters, and author of these six books. And I'm going to tell you how you can get your hands on them for free at the end of the show. Most importantly today, though, I'm the host of Dream Business Radio now in its 10th year. This is episode 550. Can't believe that. I have such a great guest today, Genevieve Paturo. And Genevieve, how are you doing today? I'm fine, Captain. Ready for my ride. All right. Hey, folks, this episode is brought to you by the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program. So if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner, if you'd like to grow a more profitable business faster, and especially if you're interested in learning how to create multiple streams of revenue, then you want to be part of this extraordinary virtual mastermind group led by me, Captain Jim, the Dream Business Coach. You can learn more about the Dream Business Mastermind at dreambizcoaching.com, dreambizcoaching.com. Okay, I want to tell you about this my latest ebook, believe it or not, I've written, this will be uh, my sixth one. And I've, I just literally finished my next one. It's coming out next month. Then I'm taking a break, taking this summer off. But this one is how to be an, how being an author is your entrepreneur is an entrepreneur's success advantage. I detail my journey from writing my first book in 2009 to then writing, um, well, it's actually going to be seven books very soon and a whole bunch of ebooks and, and core online courses and things like that. So you can learn there is a strategy. It's not enough just to tick the box and say I'm an author. So you learn the strategy that I use. You can get a free copy of this ebook at getyourbookpublishedfast.com. Get your book published fast.com. OK, let me introduce my very special guest. I'm, I'll tell you what. Genevieve is a five times award-winning best-selling author. She's an inspirational speaker, founder of Pajama Program, and she is all about purpose and the human connection. She was a successful television marketing executive until a sudden inner voice challenged her direction and she dramatically altered the path in her life. Genevieve found her true purpose when a simple question from a six-year-old girl in an emergency shelter changed everything. In 2001, she jumped off the corporate ladder and found the founded the hugely successful national nonprofit Pajama Program. This year, the program celebrates its 22nd anniversary, having delivered, listen to this, more than 7 million magical gifts of new pajamas and new books to children through its 42 chapters across the United States. Genevieve's book is called Purpose, Passion, and Pajamas. You can see it over her shoulder. How to Transform Your Life, Embrace the Human Connection, and Lead with Meaning. And it debuted during the COVID shutdown to rave reviews. Genevieve has been interviewed on many local and national media, including Oprah, Hall uh, Hallmark's Hall of Fame, The Huckabee Show, Today, Good Morning America, The Early Show, Fox and Friends, and yes, even Dream Business Radio. So Genevieve, Welcome to the program again. I'm so excited to um, to have you on. I'm so excited too, Captain Jim. So first of all, I've had in just in the last 90 days alone, over 100 pe 150 people apply to, to be on the show, which is only a weekly show. So, <laughs> you know, so maybe about every other week, I'll look through the list of in, obviously email. I'm scrolling, 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 looking for something to jump out. And honestly, I saw a pajama program and it's it's like I stopped dead in my track like, er, <laughs> what is that? And then I, I was I was captivated with your story and I just knew that I wanted to share. Well, first of all, I think we're we're we think a lot alike about um, that type of thing. And um, so I knew your story would be very, very inspirational. And I think it's um, especially with today's uh, just the climate of news and just the stuff going on. I'm, I'm going to bring some really great happy news to you today, folks that are listening and watching. So Genevieve, would you take a few minutes and, and kind of walk us through the beginning? So I started in 2001 and you started in 2001. What was, what was that initial calling? You know, I always wanted to be an executive in a big city reaching for that corner office. That was growing up. That was my goal. And being the firstborn of four Italian kids in an Italian family, dad off the boat, I was expected to, to have a job, but to have kids, you know, to have a family pretty young, you know, in my early 20s. But that wasn't that wasn't what I wanted. I watched TV. I watched Mary Tyler Moore. Mm. And here she was, this single corporate lady just making her way in a man's world. And so that's what I wanted to do. That to me was success. And I did that. And 12 years in, in New York City as VP of marketing for some TV syndication companies, 
I was a workaholic, fun life, good money, all of that. I heard a voice in a moment that I was alone in my in my co-op. And the voice asked me, if this is the next 30 years of your life, is this enough? And I had, I had never stopped that climb. I had never heard that voice. And I it stopped me cold. It frightened me, actually, because I didn't hmm. know where it came from. I wasn't accustomed to hearing voices or having any premonitions. You know, I, that wasn't anything I experienced. But all of a sudden, I answered no, and and I sat down, and it was a it was an incredible moment of almost admitting something I didn't even know I felt. Like I'm going to be alone in 30 years if I'm doing this. I'm going to be a workaholic. I'm going to look twice as old as my as my age. And and what am I going to have? What will I have done and contributed? All of that came rushing back, and I realized that there was something in that have a family, have a family, where are the mm. grandchildren? And so I thought, how can I bring children into my life? And that's what led me to an emergency shelter with a, a bag of children's books in the hopes of reading to the children that were brought there. How did you know the shelters were there? I mean, it was just sort of, you know, they exist, but did you know where they were and that there were kids going to be there? No, I didn't. Um, in that moment, when I said, how can I bring children into my lives? I had recently seen a story on the news, and we all hear them, sadly, about the police removing children from a mm -hmm. trauma, horrible uh, episode in an apartment or in a house where they were supposed to be cared for by adults. And I called the police and I said, where where do you bring children that are you're, you're taking out of home? And he said, social workers and police can go in and rescue these children after a certain calls and, and diagnosing the situation and take them to emergency shelters in, in most cities. And here in New York, there are a couple that are public and a lot mm -hmm. that are private. So he gave me the number, uh, the name of a couple of the public ones. And I called and I asked them if I could come in and read to the children at night. And they thought that was a lovely idea. And I learned later that this is where they process these children. And the children are, are brought in day and night and in, in whatever state they're in. And they're, and they're processed there, which is a horrible mm. phrase. And to, I would help to keep them occupied and, and sort of quiet in, in that tense time. Whereas, um, just out of curiosity, so you hear about child protective services. Is that a different thing than the emergency shelters? Is the emergency shelter like stage one and then they get placed? Like, where did you actually go? Well, I went to one that was city run and I went to some in, in the subsequent weeks and months that were private. So they, the city ones that are run and most of them that are um, tied to police and social workers, they are tied to the whole system. And so okay. they, they will register that the children are here and what happened exactly. And then there's a whole bunch of, of paperwork to see who are they? Has this happened before? What are the options? So it's it's complicated, but thankfully it's a safe place. So you did you didn't have kids at the time, but so how did you have kids' books? Did you have to go buy? Did you feel like well, I'm going to go do this? So did you have to go buy the books and then I go did. to the shelter? Wow. Yes, I did. And I, actually, I went looking for books that my mom read to us. I couldn't find them, you know, except for a couple of them. But but my mom made them up, you know. And, and so many things came back to me as I was reading to these children that my mom did. You know, she made up stories and she made up a whole beautiful bedtime routine that I hadn't thought about for 30 mm. years. You know, I, I didn't reflect ever on how important bedtime is until I saw how they were going to sleep after I read to them. And, and that's what changed everything. One night I followed after I read to these children who, as you can imagine, came in in whatever they were wearing. And most of the time they were soiled clothes. They weren't fitting properly. The children were, were a mess. I mean, they, they weren't taken care of well. So when I went to follow where they were going to sleep after I read for about an hour, I saw them huddled together in, you know, small cots and futons. And it was a very, very bare room, just like the ones that most of the ones I read in. And I had these, these memories of my mom and the love and comfort. Mm -hmm. And here I am looking at these children struggling not to cry, afraid. And I thought they're sleeping in these tight, dirty clothes. How, how are they going to, have, a, have any kind of a, a dream or a peaceful sleep. They're going to have nightmares. Mm. I, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to go and grab them all and put them under my coat.
But what I said was to the staff person, can I please bring pajamas? Do you think I can bring pajamas next time? And she loved the idea. And then I did. And after I read to them and I started handing them out, there was a little girl who was a mess. Her clothes were too tight and, and soiled and her hair was, pigtails were, were just a mess. She was, she was just a beautiful, frightened little girl. And she wouldn't take the pajamas I tried to give her. She was so afraid of me and I didn't know why then. And she just kept shaking her head no, but she wanted to watch me give them away to the other kids who took them. Mm -hmm. So finally, one last time I went over and I knelt by her to give them to her. I tried to have her touch them. And I tried to tell her she could keep them. She wouldn't have to give them back and she could have them forever. And she leaned in and, and she just whispered, what, what are pajamas? What are oh, they? Oh my goodness. And she couldn't even say the word pajamas. She was stuttering. You know, she, she, she'd never heard of it. And I looked up at the, at the staff person. I was like, didn't think I heard her right. And she, she just mouthed to me. She doesn't know what pajamas are. And that's, that was the moment that everything became clear and unclear as to why I was following this path of money and success and, and what I thought was, you know, something worthwhile. And here I am with this little girl that would break anybody's heart. And, and I just said, we have to fix this. So what, so was that like the first or second night when, so you went to read books and then you brought back pajamas. What happened after that? Yeah. Um, several weeks in, before I had the nerve to follow where they were taking them to, to go to sleep. So it was several weeks of reading books to the children and mm -hmm. just wondering what, what had happened to them to bring them there. And then I started bringing pajamas to that place every week and other places. And I think that the staff loved the idea the kids loved the idea. So I was getting calls from the staffers, friends who were staff at other shelters. Oh my! And so my phone was ringing and at those those days, 20 some years ago, you know, the phones were big and you weren't supposed to have them in the office. So I was trying to hide and, and muffle the rings, but I couldn't say no, you know, so I'm so-and-so I'm friends with so-and-so we have kids here. We have kids here. So I started running around like crazy. Did they start calling you the pajama lady or pajama the, mama? Pajama mama. <laughs> oh my goodness. So the pajama mama and, and word just spread, I'm sure amongst these shelters. Cause they're, I'm sure anybody that smiles goes once is, is, going to be touched like you were so yeah. just just for the sake of time because we only got about 25 minutes so w after you're going and you're going to different places and by the way you're funding this all just with the money you were making at your job right well yes and credit card debt that's a whole other mess i got oh, myself my. into yeah. so you really felt calling and I'm, I'm sure your your parents with their upbringing said no you're not don't go into debt and things like that but here you are you got your job you got your apartment everything but you're funding the, the kids on credit cards yeah wow yeah, yeah. And, I, so, and i was lying and trying to juggle you know my work which of course was not a priority which was noticeable so yeah. i was i was fighting and i didn't tell anyone for a long time because what do you tell people you know like you said i couldn't imagine anybody saying great idea Quit yeah. your job. <laughs> no, a lot of people say, like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Exactly those words. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So um, approximately from when you started to when did you get the idea to do this full time to start the nonprofit? Like, how far did you? I don't, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but did you spiral down with debt and, and you're trying to balance your job and do all? I mean, it must have gotten where you got a little crazy. Yeah, it was it was hard. I, I you know, I've always been honest with people who've asked me to mentor or to help even along the way, you know, and they heard my story. And in my book, I'm super honest. It was over a year and a half that I that I was struggling and, you know, emotionally and financially. Mm -hmm. And until I started to tell people I was trying to hold on to my job and, you know, I went to part time and nobody was happy with my work because I, I was, you know, I was faking it. And I was running around town and I met a, a great guy and I was afraid to tell him. And he was you know, the first friend I told. She said, what you, what you said before, are you crazy? You've worked so hard. What are you going to do? You're not, you're not saving their lives. You, you know, yeah. you're in pajamas. And I wasn't prepared. I couldn't, I didn't have any answers. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I met this great guy and I said, I better tell him because he thinks I have a job that I love and I'm going to keep and we're going to be a two income couple. And he said, I think it's beautiful. Go for it. Oh, wow. And then I got a little braver, a little braver, you know, but um, 
I got us, you know, both into financial trouble and, and, you know, almost, you know, almost was the, the end of our newly weddism and our wedding, but, but he stuck with me and, and I found a way years later, still working on it to, um, to ba- try to, to balance and have, you know, a- and be supportive of, of him, but we made it. And pajama program, as you said, is doing really well. And a few years ago, I wanted to write my book and and speak about finding purpose, especially after the pandemic. So, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. There's so much more to to life than a paycheck and paid insurance and vacation. Um, so you got the idea to start it. Was it your idea? Was it your hus- husband's idea to start a nonprofit? Or yeah, no, I didn't know anything about starting a nonprofit. I was just doing this, and I mm-hmm. and I didn't know what it would mean financially. You know, I I said to him, look, I'll I'll work at McDonald's if I have to on the overnight shift. I just have to do this. But what happened was uh, somebody called me from a national ma- magazine, parenting magazine, and said, are you the lady running around Harlem with a bag of oh pajamas? And I said, yes. And she said, can I write a little, like just a blurb? And I said, sure. Well, that blurb brought thousands and thousands of boxes and letters and cash <gasps> to my little apartment. And one of the letters we couldn't even see, you know, the boxes were, were high, we're eating on the boxes and opening them. I had no idea that people would, would react that way. And one letter said from a company, if you send us your 501c3, we'd like to consider you a grant. So what's a 501c3 exactly, you said? Exactly, <laughs> Captain Jim. I, look, I looked at this paper. I'm saying to, to my new husband, what is this 501, then this parentheses, this little small letter C and a number three. And I, and I showed it to him. And, and when I found out, I said, this is a responsibility. Look how many people trusted me. Yes. You know, and then I found you know, then the work began and, and the legal work and the, you know, getting it's not easy to start a nonprofit at all. That's a lot no, of work. It was a blessing. I didn't know anything mm-hmm. because it's not easy, wow. but you know, the stars so aligned. You, yeah. So you started it and you know, it, it's become wildly successful and did the, the, and I know you've been on with Oprah and, and all these different people how, what was the time frame before it really caught fire? And by caught fire, I'll say the money being donated, the revenue coming in was now covering the expenses. Was that like five years, three years? Yeah. I would say between, I would say three years, we started to be able to use some other people's money to buy pajamas, but we didn't mm-hmm. have a real budget for at least five years, you know? So, so it was, it was hard, but it was also so much fun. You know, that's the best part, right? Of any business. Every win is a big win. Yes. Every day you're closer. And it's it's the part where you're you're in the, you know, you're in the weeds, you're in in the earth, and it feels so good. You're close to those you're serving. And it's just, you know, I look back and I and I talk to to people who I worked with at that early time, and that was the best. So um there's this thing, and I know you when you and I met a month ago, I shared with you that for five years before we started traveling, I was rehabbing homes for low-income people. And it's like so busy, so busy. But one Saturday a month we go do, and it was just like the most uplifting thing. And I just called it, you know, it this is your your reality. This is the reality of life, not what you're building over here, right? Yeah. So I get that. At what point um did you start did this thing grow to the point where you you have staff? I know you got a big board now. You got all I mean it's a fully functioning nonprofit. What was that journey like? And and yeah. because excuse me, I got to ask ask them one more follow mm-hmm. because all of a sudden what happens now is you're you're like the driver of this to now you have to actually be a leader <laughs> with a whole staff and board. There's a whole other conversation learning to be the leader you want to be because Yes. I speak now on leadership. And okay. I had bosses. I didn't grow up with leaders who inspire. I didn't grow up with the word, find your purpose. Um, I grew up with bosses who told me what to do. And we sat at a table and, you know, basically he talked. Um, and it was mostly, I can't even think of a she, it was a he. And it's very different. And I, and I found myself because I was leading with my heart, as most good leaders do. Mm-hmm. It was about inspiring people to want to be part of something bigger than you for more than a paycheck. Yes, a paycheck. Everyone deserves to live the life they want and it's right. possible. But there there was a bigger a bigger goal. And even though those who I hired didn't have the exact same purpose, it aligned. Their purpose aligned 
with what they wanted to contribute to the world, to their community. And I think we're all learning that. And, and the old bosses, I think, are either learning that or, you know, are going, you know, going into retirement because they they enjoyed it the way it was. Yeah. Um, a, a longtime friend and coaching client, Phil Brakefield, I helped him with a nonprofit and um, years, a couple of years. And then we, we figured out another way to do it. But um, I'm curious about the kids. Did you see the same kids over and over again, or did they get shuffled around and you were constantly seeing new kids? Mm, mostly shuffled around because the emergency shelters, that's the nature of it. You know, they take them in in the worst moment and then they place them if there's no way to send them to another family member or sometimes back to the same one, just on, uh, you know, being watched closely. But there are a few, um, and I did work with a few, especially in the early days, where they they one of them brought moms who were in rehab or in prison back together with the children. So for mm -hmm. years, the children would be in the care of this group and then rejoined with families. So there were a few that had the same children and, and the kids grew up together. Um. I want to ask you about your. Uh, I want to. I want to ask you about your your book, but I have to ask you. One, I'm so fascinated with how you. There was this book. I can't remember. It was the the twelve people you meet in heaven or something like that? I forget. I think uh, Mitch Album wrote it, but it was oh. like how you touch people's lives and you never know it until. Have Have you ever come into contact with children, ten twenty years later that said, "Oh, I remember you." You know, has that ever happened, or do they just kind of go far and wide and? Not remember. Well, there was one little girl early, early in in this delivery of uh, books and pajamas that she, she was two. And I took a picture of her because this, while you can't take pictures of most of the kids, it's certainly not then either. One woman who ran it called Our Children in Queens, H-O-U-R, she was a nun and they convinced judges to let them have the children while mom's unfortunately had to stay in prison for a while. She wanted to always reunite them. And she said, if people don't know our work, we'll get no support. So take all the pictures you want and talk mm -hmm. about us. Okay. And so I did. So there was a little girl and um, Teresa and I gave her pajamas and I actually took a picture of them and they were a pair of Carter's pajamas just because the tag would happen to be hanging, not because it was on purpose. So we did keep in touch with her because she was part of that one group where her mom was um, in, in therapy for years. And so she grew up in this orphanage setting with the nuns and other kids. And so we knew, and she would come as she got older and read with us and then read to the little kids. And when we had our anniversary of 15 years, I invited her to come and speak because she was 18 wow. and she was going to college. She, she had been on the, on a good road there. She was well taken care of and she was a, a, a smart girl and she wanted to go to college. And I invited her to come and speak. And she spoke when we were honoring the president of Carter's and she came up this poised young lady and she told everyone um, how she remembered the day that picture was taken. And I showed it and, and the Carter's president. Oh was my right gosh. There. It was, the, everyone was in tears. I was in tears. And she just said how much she learned to trust people and, and love to read because we read stories to her, you know, every time she came and she was able to take the books back to where she was going to sleep at night and how, that just helped her learn how to dream and, and read. So you can imagine wow. how everyone in that audience. Felt. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask you about your book um, and uh, just a couple chapters. And you can just say a sentence or two, because there's a lot of chapters and I love the titles. So the real meaning of life, obviously what's, what's behind that? You know, people used to say, look, the power of one, look what you did. And I used to say it about everybody. I think a lot of us say it. Oh, look, he, he or she thought of that idea. The power of one's amazing. And you know what? The meaning of life is not that anyone wants or can do anything alone. It's not the power of one that changes things. It's the power of one another that moves mountains and moves people. And we have to get that through our thick skulls. We need each other and we've got to be together. That's, that's awesome. How about the ones who know the score? What's that about? That was about the teenagers that we saw. And I and I designed some programs for the teenagers in shelters and in group homes, orphanages, because the little ones are resilient. You know, a lady comes with a box of pajamas, they're excited. Somebody comes with clothes and food and gives them a party, they're excited. I know that there's 
remains a hole in them and it doesn't fix their life, but their lives. But these teenagers, once you, when you meet them, they already know the situation. Mm -hmm. They, they know some sad things about what's happened to them. And, you know, it's, it breaks your heart when you think everyone wants to adopt a baby and they think the same thing, you know, everyone wants to adopt a baby. I'm here until I'm 18 and I want out, but they really don't have, I'm not prepared for out. Yeah. Um, Genevieve, chapter seven was um, dangerous sacrifices. I'm curious if that was, could, did you in dangerous situations or obviously um, Harlem was, was no picnic, I guess, back then. Yeah. I, I Right. I was in some scary places alone at night, but, um, you know, I, I didn't even realize it. You know, I was writing and I, and I did remember a couple of times when I said to myself, I better run across this field. Because mm. carrying all these bags, I'm an easy target. But also, you know, I sacrificed um, sharing what I what I love to do. Um, it put my my early marriage in jeopardy. That wasn't the best way. So, you know, when I mentor and coach people, there are things, you know, I, I sacrificed somebody else's name on my financial records too, you know, bringing them down. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it ended up, good you yeah. know i have to say that but it was it was scary and it was my fault and you know and i just couldn't see past that obsession you know all those kids got about five minutes left i want to ask one more book question then we'll, we'll circle back um you're either a looker or a leaper love that yeah <laughs> yeah yep. um you i leapt i jumped i didn't look um could, it worked for me in the end it doesn't work for everyone some people, and I coach both, I say that they slide. We, we can slide. They look, they see the the landscape, they feel comfortable, like I can slide into my passion over here on Saturdays. Um, you know, they look and they try to figure it out. So you're either somebody who looks or somebody who leaps. Some, some, what are, what are both, what are either? Yeah. That's so awesome. Um, so I was on your looking all over your website um, for the nonprofit, and you have something called the Good Night Advisory Council. What is that? Right, right. Well, a couple of years ago, after 20 years, I decided to write my book and speak about finding purpose. I feel like that's my second purpose, part two. So Jamie is our executive director now. And so we had spoken before I passed the baton about the nighttime and how how frightening it is and how important it is. And we all know about sleep now for these kids, especially. So they are under Jamie's direction, a group of professionals who know how to teach both adults, caregivers, parents, relatives, and even children of a certain age, how important it is to get some sleep and mm. also help, help the staff and help all of us sponsors and supporters understand the bedtime, the importance of it. Um, it's interesting when, when I interview um, successful business owners, sometimes they'll, they'll say, if I knew what I was going to go through, then I probably wouldn't have started. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you that question, like um, about your journey from leaving corporate America, the early days, fundraising, credit card debt, I'm sure 80 hours a week. Um, if you knew how hard it was going to be, would you have done it? And <laughs> how do you look back on it now? I'm, I'm sure it's pretty fondly. Yes, it's you know I wouldn't trade it for for anything. My life is totally different, and you know I'm not ready to die. But if I did, <laughs> I would say, "Thank <laughs> God I did this one good thing." Um, maybe not. I, I might have scared myself, you know, mm -hmm. scared myself away from it or keeping it small. But like I said, those thousands of boxes said we trust you, and so I I felt compelled to gain and keep that trust. And then the rest was one step in the dark after another. Yeah. Well, so my final question, um, what kind of message do you have for the, you know, small business owners and entrepreneurs who, who listen to this and, and watch this uh, podcast, you know, thinking of either, or the, what I call entrepreneurs, they're in corporate America and maybe they're thinking of leaving, or maybe they're small business owners and they're doing really, really good, but they've been inspired, like do something else. I, I wrote about this in um, a, a book I wrote called Surf First, where a lot of people think you know, they read about stories 
people that go and build schools in Africa, they dig wells all over. So there's really big things, but not everybody feels they can do really big things. My favorite expression is one person helping one person can change that one person's life. So you don't have to do the grand thing. What, what kind of inspiration would you, um, an encouragement could you, could, could you give my audience based on what you did that, that evening when you felt that voice or heard the voice? Yeah, I, I asked them that same question. If this is the next 30 years of your life, is this enough? Is what you're doing enough? And you're right. You do not have to climb Mount Everest. But if you feel that there's something that you've put on the back burner or that you want to do more and you're afraid, if this is the next 30 years of your life, is this enough as it is? Yeah, it's really great. What an honor to meet you. And, and I'm so happy I got to share your story. And um, so how do you, how can people, first of all, connect? That's just my usual question, but is there a way that they can, I'm sure on your website, if somebody wanted to donate, whether monetarily or send pajamas, like I'm sure okay. people are listening, want to know what to do, what to do now. Sure, sure. Well, I, my website for my, my support is GenevievePaturo.com. It's speaking, it's my classes, all of that. And I, please email me at Jen at GenevievePaturo.com. And I'm happy to talk, brainstorm, you know, for, with anybody about anything that they want to do. And if they're afraid, believe me, I know afraid. Um, and pajama program is pajamaprogram.org, O-R-G. Good. And that's, so you, you've said you've passed the baton. So mm -hmm. you have a new exec. I saw another different executive director and so it continues to flourish from, from your roots. Yes. <laughs> Yes. That's so awesome. Well, God bless the work you're doing. And I'm, I'm so impressed with you and, and thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, Captain Jim. Hey folks, that wraps up this very special and inspiring interview with uh, Genevieve Paturo. And um, you can connect with me, by the way, at getjimpalmer.com. If you're interested in joining uh, me and about uh, 26 other entrepreneurs in the Dream Business Mastermind, you can go to dreambizcoaching.com. That's dreambizcoaching.com. Remember, you can get a free copy of my latest ebook, which is how being an author is your success advantage at get your book published fast.com. Speaking of books, you can get as part of my legacy, you can get all six of my dream business um, books. They're free at Amazon in terms of Kindle. If you're, if you're into Barnes and Noble Nook books, you can go there. And they're also in the iBook store. So that's just mm -hmm. um, my way to help more people and still work three days a week because I'm not going to stop that. <laughs> so anyway, but it, thanks again to uh, Genevieve. Just incredibly inspiring. There is more than, uh, than a balance sheet. To, to business and life. So until this time next week, folks, another fantastic interview. I'm Captain Jim Palmer and I am the dream business coach and you take good care.